section ten of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter nine which treats of things seen as for example the breakfast it is six o'clock the hired men and oxen are gone the breakfast-table stands before the open kitchen door snowy with its fresh cloth the old silver coffee-pot steaming up a refreshing perfume and the doctor sits on one side sipping his coffee and looking across the table at mary who is innocently pleased at the kindly beaming in his placid blue eyes and aunt katie scudder discourses of housekeeping and fancies something must have disturbed the rising of the cream as it is not so thick and yellow as want now the doctor it is to be confessed was apt to fall into a way of looking at people such as pertains to philosophers and scholars generally that is as if he were looking through them into the infinite in which case his gaze became so earnest and intent that it would quite embarrass an uninitiated person but mary being used to this style of contemplation was only quietly amused and waited till some great thought should loom up before his mental vision in which case she hoped to hear from him the good man swallowed his first cup of coffee and spoke in the millennium i suppose there will be such a fullness and plenty of all the necessaries and conveniences of life that it will not be necessary for men and women to spend the greater part of their lives in labour in order to procure a living it will not be necessary for each one to labour more than two or three hours a day not more than will conduce to health of body and vigour of mind and the rest of their time they will spend in reading and conversation and such exercises as are necessary and proper to improve their minds and make progress in knowledge new england presents probably the only example of a successful commonwealth founded on a theory as a distinct experiment in the problem of society it was for this reason that the minds of its great thinkers dwelt so much on the final solution of that problem in this world the fact of a future millennium was a favourite doctrine of the great leading theologians of new england and dr h dwelt upon it with a peculiar partiality indeed it was the solace and refuge of his soul when oppressed with the discouragements which always attend things actual to dwell upon and draw out in detail the splendours of this perfect future which was destined to glorify the world nobody therefore at the cottage was in the least surprised when there dropped into the flow of their daily life these sparkling bits of ore which their friend had dug in his explorations of a future canaan in fact they served to raise the hackneyed present out of the level of mere commonplace but how will it be possible inquired mrs scudder that so much less work will suffice in those days to do all that is to be done because of the great advance of arts and sciences which will take place before those days said the doctor whereby everything shall be performed with so much greater ease also the great increase of disinterested love whereby the skill and talents of those who have much shall make up for the weakness of those who have less yes he continued after a pause all the careful marthas in those days will have no excuse for not sitting at the feet of jesus there will be no cumbering with much serving the church will have only marys in those days this remark made without the slightest personal intention called a curious smile into mrs scudder's face which was reflected in a slight blush from mary's when the crack of a whip and the rattling of wagon-wheels disturbed the conversation and drew all eyes to the door there appeared the vision of mr zebedee marvin's farm wagon stored with barrels boxes and baskets over which candace sat throned triumphant her black face and yellow striped turban glowing in the fresh morning with a hearty joyous light as she pulled up the reins and shouted to the horse to stop with a voice that might have done credit to any man living dear me if there isn't candace said mary queen of ethiopia said the doctor who sometimes adventured a very placid joke the doctor was universally known in all the neighbourhood as a sort of friend and patron saint of the negro race 
he had devoted himself to their interests with a zeal unusual in those days his church numbered more of them than any in newport and his hours of leisure from study were often spent in lowliest visitations among them hearing their stories consoling their sorrows advising and directing their plans teaching them reading and writing and he often drew hard on his slender salary to assist them in their emergencies and distresses this unusual condescension on his part was repaid on theirs with all the warmth of their race and candace in particular devoted herself to the doctor with all the force of her being there was a legend current in the neighbourhood that the first efforts to catechise candace were not eminently successful her modes of contemplating theological tenets being so peculiarly from her own individual point of view that it was hard to get her subscription to a received opinion on the venerable clause in the catechism in particular which declares that all men sinned in adam and fell with him candace made a dead halt i didn't do dat ar for one i knows i's got good memory allers knows what i does never did eat dat ar apple never eat a bit ob him don't tell me it was of no use of course to tell candace of all the explanations of this redoubtable passage of potential presence and representative presence and representative identity and federal headship she met all with the dog it never did it i know should have remembered if i had don't tell me and even in the catechizing class of the doctor himself if this answer came to her she sat black and frowning in stony silence even in his reverend presence candace was often reminded that the doctor believed the catechism and that she was differing from a great and good man but the argument made no manner of impression on her till one day a far-off cousin of hers whose condition under a hard master had often moved her compassion came in overjoyed to recount to her how owing to dr h s exertions he had gained his freedom the doctor himself had in person gone from house to house raising the sum for his redemption and when more yet was wanting supplied it by paying half his last quarter's limited salary he do dat ar said candace dropping the fork wherewith she was spearing doughnuts den i'm gwine to believe every word he does and accordingly at the next catechizing the doctor's astonishment was great when candace pressed up to him exclaiming de lord bless you doctor for opening de prison for dem dat is bound i believes in you now doctor i's gwine to believe every word you say i'll say to catechize now fix it any way you like i did eat dat ar apple i eat de whole tree and swallow every bit of it if you say so and this very thorough profession of faith was followed on the part of candace by years of the most strenuous orthodoxy her general mode of expressing her mind on the subject was short and definitive law me what's de use i set out to believe de catechise and i'm gwine to believe it so while we have been telling you all this about her she has fastened her horse and is swinging leisurely up to the house with a basket on either arm good morning candace said mrs scudder what brings you so early come down for light to sell my chickens and eggs got a lot of money for em too missy marvin she sent miss scudder some turkey eggs and i brought down some of my doughnuts for de doctor good folks must live you know as well as wicked ones and candace gave a hearty unctuous laugh no reason why doctors shouldn't hab good tings as well as sinners is dere and she shook in great billows and showed her white teeth in the abandon of her laugh lor bress ye honey child she said turning to mary why ye looks like a new rose every bit don't wonder somebody was allers prying and spying about here how is your mistress candace said mrs scudder by way of changing the subject well poorly rather poorly when massa jim goes peers like taken de light right out her eyes dat ar boy trains round arter his mudder like a cosset he does lor he de house seems so still without him can't a fly scratch his ear but it starts a body missy marvin she sent down and says would you and de doctor and miss mary please come to tea dis arter noon thank your mistress candace said mrs scudder mary and i will come 
and the doctor perhaps looking at the good man who had relapsed into meditation and was eating his breakfast without taking note of anything going on it will be time enough to tell him of it she said to mary when we have to wake him up to dress so we won't disturb him now to mary the prospect of the visit was a pleasant one for reasons which she scarce gave a definite form to of course like a good girl she had come to a fixed and settled resolution to think of james as little as possible but when the path of duty lay directly along scenes and among people fitted to recall him it was more agreeable than if it had lain in another direction added to this a very tender and silent friendship subsisted between mrs marvyn and mary in which besides similarity of mind and intellectual pursuits there was a deep unspoken element of sympathy candace watched the light in mary's eyes with the instinctive shrewdness by which her race seemed to divine the thoughts and feelings of their superiors and chuckled to herself internally without ever having been made a confidant by any party or having a word said to her or before her still the whole position of affairs was as clear to her as if she had seen it on a map she had appreciated at once mrs scudder's coolness james's devotion and mary's perplexity and inly resolved that if the little maiden did not think of james in his absence it should not be her fault laws miss scudder she said i's right glad you's comin cause you hasn't seen how we's kind of splendified since massa jim come home you wouldn't know it why he's got mats from mogador on all de entries and a great big un on a on de parlor and you ought to see de shawl he brought missus and all de curus kind of tangs to de squire tell you dat our boy honors his father and mother if he don't do nothing else and dat's de fust commandment would promise ma'am and to see him a-settin up every day in prayer time so handsome holdin missus hand and lookin right into her eyes all de time why dat our boy is one of de elect it's just as clare to me and elect has got to come in dat's what i say my face strong real clare tell you she added with a triumphant laugh which usually chorused her conversation and turning to the doctor who aroused by her loud and vigorous strain was attending with interest to her well candace he said we all hope you are right hope doctor i don't hope i knows tell you when i pray for him don't i feel enlarged tell you it goes with a rush i can feel it gwine up like a rushin mighty wind i feel strong i do that's right candace said the doctor keep on your prayers stand as much chance with god as if you were a crowned queen the lord is no respecter of persons that's where he ain't doctor and there's where i agree wid him said candace as she gathered her baskets vigorously together and after a sweeping curtsey went sailing down to her wagon full late with content shouting a hearty good morning missus with the full power of her cheerful lungs as she rode off as the doctor looked after her the simple pleased expression with which he had watched her gradually faded and there passed over his broad good face a shadow as of a cloud on a mountain side what a shame it is he said what a scandal and disgrace to the protestant religion that christians of america should openly practise and countenance this enslaving of the africans i have for a long time holden my peace may the lord forgive me but i believe the time is coming when i must utter my voice i cannot go down to the wharves or among the shipping without these poor dumb creatures look at me so that i am ashamed as if they asked me what i a christian minister was doing that i did not come to their help i must testify mrs scudder looked grave at this earnest announcement she had heard many like it before and they always filled her with alarm because shall we tell you why well then it was not because she was not a thoroughly indoctrinated anti-slavery woman her husband who did all her thinking for her had been a man of ideas beyond his day and never for a moment countenanced the right of slavery so far as to buy or own a servant or attendant of any kind and mrs scudder had always followed decidedly along the path of his opinions and practice and never hesitated to declare the reasons for the faith that was in her but if any of us could imagine an angel drop down out of heaven with wings ideas notions manners and customs all fresh from that very different country we might easily suppose that the most pious and orthodox family might find the task of presenting him in general society and piloting him along the courses of this world 
a very delicate and embarrassing one however much they might reverence him on their own private account their hearts would probably sink within them at the idea of allowing him to expand himself according to his previous nature and habits in the great world without in like manner men of high unworldly natures are often reverenced by those who are somewhat puzzled what to do with them practically mrs scudder considered the doctor as a superior being possessed by a holy helplessness in all things material and temporal which imposed on her the necessity of thinking and caring for him and previsiting the earthly and material aspects of his affairs there was not in newport a more thriving and reputable business at that time than the slave trade large fortunes were constantly being turned out in it and what better providential witness of its justice could most people require beside this in their own little church she reflected with alarm that simeon brown the richest and most liberal supporter of the society had been and was then drawing all his wealth from this source and rapidly there flashed before her mind a picture of one and another influential persons who were holders of slaves therefore when the doctor announced i must testify she rattled her teaspoon uneasily and answered in what way doctor do you think of bearing testimony the subject i think is a very difficult one difficult i think no subject can be clearer if we were right in our war for liberty we are wrong in making slaves or keeping them oh i did not mean said mrs scudder that it was difficult to understand the subject the right of the matter is clear but what to do is the thing i shall preach about it said the doctor my mind has run upon it some time i shall show to the house of judah their sin in this matter i fear there will be great offence given said mrs scudder there's simeon brown one of our largest supporters he is in the trade ah yes but he will come out of it of course he will he is all right all clear i was delighted with the clearness of his views the other night and thought then of bringing them to bear on this point only as others were present i deferred it but i can show him that it follows logically from his principles i am confident of that i think you'll be disappointed in him doctor i think he'll be angry and get up a commotion and leave the church madam said the doctor do you suppose that a man who would be willing even to give up his eternal salvation for the greatest good of the universe could hesitate about a few paltry thousands that perish in the using he may feel willing to give up his soul said mrs scudder naively but i don't think he'll give up his ships that's quite another matter he won't see it to be his duty then ma'am he'll be a hypocrite a gross hypocrite if he won't said the doctor it is not christian charity to think it of him i shall call upon him this morning and tell him my intentions but doctor exclaimed mrs scudder with a start pray think a little more of it you know a great many things depend on him why he has subscribed for twenty copies of your system of theology i hope you'll remember that and why should i remember that said the doctor hastily turning round suddenly enkindled his blue eyes flashing out of their usual misty calm what has my system of theology to do with the matter why said mrs scudder it's of more importance to get right views of the gospel before the world than anything else is it not and if by any imprudence in treating influential people this should be prevented more harm than good would be done madam said the doctor i'd sooner my system should be sunk in the sea than it should be a millstone round my neck to keep me from my duty let god take care of my theology i must do my duty and as the doctor spoke he straightened himself to the full dignity of his height his face kindling with an unconscious majesty and as he turned his eye fell on mary who was standing with her slender figure dilated her large blue eye wide and bright in a sort of trance of solemn feeling half smiles half tears and the strong heroic man started to see this answer to his higher soul in the sweet tremulous mirror of womanhood one of those lightning glances passed between his eyes and hers which are the freemasonry of noble spirits and by a sudden impulse they approached each other he took both her outstretched hands looked down into her face with a look full of admiration and a sort of naive wonder 
then as if her inspired silence had been a voice to him he laid his hand on her head and said god bless you child out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger in a moment he was gone mary said mrs scudder laying her hand on her daughter's arm the doctor loves you i know he does mother said mary innocently and i love him dearly he is a noble grand man mrs scudder looked keenly at her daughter mary's eye was as calm as a june sky and she began composedly gathering up the teacups she did not understand me thought the mother End of section 10section eleven of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter ten the test of theology the doctor went immediately to his study and put on his best coat and his wig and surmounting them by his cocked hat walked manfully out of the house with his gold-headed cane in his hand there he goes said mrs scudder looking regretfully after him he is such a good man but he has not the least idea how to get along in the world he never thinks of anything but what is true he hasn't a particle of management about him seems to me said mary that is like an apostle you know mother st paul says in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom but by the grace of god we have had our conversation in the world to be sure that is just the doctor said mrs scudder that's as like him as if it had been written for him but that kind of way somehow don't seem to do in our times it won't answer with simeon brown i know the man i know just as well now how it will all seem to him and what will be the upshot of this talk if the doctor goes there it won't do any good if it would i would be willing i feel as much desire to have this horrid trade in slaves stopped as anybody your father i'm sure said enough about it in his time but then i know it's no use trying just as if simeon brown when he is making his hundreds of thousands in it is going to be persuaded to give it up he won't he'll only turn against the doctor and won't pay his part of the salary and will use his influence to get up a party against him and our church will be broken up and the doctor driven away that's all that will come of it and all the good that he is now doing to these poor negroes will be overthrown and they never did have so good a friend if he would stay here and work gradually and get his system of theology printed and simeon brown would help at that and only drop words in season here and there till people are brought along with him why by and by something might be done but now it's just the most imprudent thing a man could undertake but mother if it really is a sin to trade in slaves and hold them i don't see how he can help himself i quite agree with him i don't see how he came to let it go so long as he has well said mrs scudder if worst comes to worst and he will do it i for one shall stand by him to the last and i for another said mary i would like him to talk with cousin zebedee about it said mrs scudder when we are up there this afternoon we will introduce the conversation he is a good sound man and the doctor thinks much of him and perhaps he may shed some light upon this matter meanwhile the doctor was making the best of his way in the strength of his purpose to test the orthodoxy of simeon brown honest old granite boulder that he was no sooner did he perceive a truth than he rolled after it with all the massive gravitation of his being inconsiderate as to what might lie in his way 
from which it is to be inferred that with all his intellect and goodness he would have been a very clumsy and troublesome inmate of the modern american church how many societies boards colleges and other good institutions have reason to congratulate themselves that he has long been among the saints with him logic was everything and to perceive a truth and not act in logical sequence from it the thing so incredible that he had not yet enlarged his capacity to take it in as a possibility that a man should refuse to hear truth he could understand in fact he had good reason to think the majority of his townsmen had no leisure to give to that purpose that men hearing truth should dispute it and argue stoutly against it he could also understand but that a man could admit a truth and not admit the plain practice resulting from it was to him a thing incomprehensible therefore spite of mrs katy scudder's discouraging observations our good doctor walked stoutly and with a trusting heart at the moment when the doctor with a silent uplifting of his soul to his invisible sovereign passed out of his study on this errand where was the disciple whom he went to seek in a small dirty room down by the wharf the windows veiled by cobwebs and dingy with the accumulated dust of ages he sat in a greasy leathern chair by a rickety office table on which were a great pewter inkstand an account book and divers papers tied with red tape opposite to him was seated a square-built individual a man of about forty whose round head shaggy eyebrows small keen eyes broad chest and heavy muscles showed a preponderance of the animal and brutal over the intellectual and spiritual this was mr scroggs the agent of a rice plantation who had come on bringing an order for a new relay of negroes to supply the deficit occasioned by fever dysentery and other causes in their last year's stock the fact is said simeon this last shipload wasn't as good a one as usual we lost more than a third of it so we can't afford to put them a penny lower ay said the other but then there are so many women well said simeon women ain't so strong perhaps to start with but then they stand it out perhaps in the long run better they're more patient some of these men the mandingos particularly are pretty troublesome to manage we lost a splendid fellow coming over on this very voyage let him on deck for air and this fellow managed to get himself loose and fought like a dragon he settled one of our men with his fist and another with a marlin spike that he caught and in fact they had to shoot him down you'll have his wife there's his son too fine fellow fifteen year old by his teeth what that lame one oh he ain't lame it's nothing but the cramps from stowing you know of course they are more or less stiff he's as sound as a nut don't much like to buy relations on account of their hatching up mischief together said mr scroggs oh that's all humbug you must keep em from coming together anyway it's about as broad as tis long there'll be wives and husbands and children among em before long start em as you will and then this woman will work better for having the boy she's kinder set on him she jabbers lots of lingo to him day and night too much i doubt said the overseer with a shrug well well i'll tell you said simeon rising i've got a few errands up town and you just step over with matlock and look over the stock just set aside any that you want and when i see em all together i'll tell you just what you shall have em for i'll be back in an hour or two and so saying simeon brown called an underling from an adjoining room and committing his customer to his care took his way uptown in a serene frame of mind like a man who comes from the calm performance of duty just as he came upon the street where was situated his own large and somewhat pretentious mansion the tall figure of the doctor loomed in sight sailing majestically down upon him making a signal to attract his attention
good morning doctor said simeon good morning mr brown said the doctor i was looking for you i did not quite finish the subject we were talking about at mrs scudder's table last night i thought i should like to go on with it a little with all my heart doctor said simeon not a little flattered turn right in mrs brown will be about her house business and we'll have the keeping room all to ourselves come right in the keeping room of mr simeon brown's house was an intermediate apartment between the ineffable glories of the front parlour and that court of the gentiles the kitchen for the presence of a large train of negro servants made the latter apartment an altogether different institution from the throne-room of mrs katy scudder this keeping-room was a low studded apartment finished with the heavy oaken beams of the wall left full in sight boarded over and painted two windows looked out on the street and another into a sort of courtyard where three black wenches each with a broom pretended to be sweeping but were in fact chattering and laughing like so many crows on one side of the room stood a heavy mahogany sideboard covered with decanters labelled gin brandy rum etc for simeon was held to be a provider of none but the best in his housekeeping heavy mahogany chairs with cruel coverings stood sentry about the room and the fireplace was flanked by two broad armchairs covered with stamped leather on ushering the doctor into this apartment simeon courteously led him to the sideboard we mustn't make our discussions too dry doctor he said what will you take thank you sir said the doctor with a wave of his hand nothing this morning and depositing his cocked hat in a chair he settled himself into one of the leathern easy-chairs and dropping his hands upon his knees looked fixedly before him like a man who is studying how to enter upon an inwardly absorbing subject well doctor said simeon seating himself opposite sipping comfortably at a glass of rum and water our views appear to be making a noise in the world everything is preparing for your volumes and when they appear the battle of new divinity i think may fairly be considered as won let us consider that though a woman may forget her first-born yet a man cannot forget his own system of theology because therein if he be a true man is the very elixir and essence of all that is valuable and hopeful to the universe and considering this let us appreciate the settled purpose of our friend whom even this tempting bait did not swerve from the end which he had in view mr brown he said all our theology is as a drop in the ocean of god's majesty to whose glory we must be ready to make any and every sacrifice certainly said mr brown not exactly comprehending the turn the doctor's thoughts were taking and the glory of god consisteth in the happiness of all his rational universe each in his proportion according to his separate amount of being so that when we devote ourselves to god's glory it is the same as saying that we devote ourselves to the highest happiness of his created universe that's clear sir said simeon rubbing his hands and taking out his watch to see the time the doctor hitherto had spoken in a laborious manner like a man who is slowly lifting a heavy bucket of thought out of an internal well i am glad to find your mind so clear on this all-important point mr brown the more so as i feel that we must immediately proceed to apply our principles at whatever sacrifice of worldly goods and i trust sir that you are one who at the call of your master would not hesitate even to lay down all your worldly possessions for the greater good of the universe i trust so sir said simeon rather uneasily and without the most distant idea what could be coming next in the mind of his reverend friend did it never occur to you my friend said the doctor that the enslaving of the african race is a clear violation of the great law 
which commands us to love our neighbours as ourselves and a dishonour upon the christian religion more particularly in us americans whom the lord hath so marvellously protected in our recent struggle for our own liberty simeon started at the first words of this address much as if some one had dashed a bucket of water on his head and after that rose uneasily walking the room and playing with the seals of his watch i i never regarded it in this light he said possibly not my friend said the doctor so much doth established custom blind the minds of the best of men but since i have given more particular attention to the case of the poor negroes here in newport the thought has more and more laboured in my mind more especially as our struggles for liberty have turned my attention to the rights which every human creature hath before god so that i find much in my former blindness and the comparative dumbness i have heretofore maintained on this subject wherewith to reproach myself for though i have borne somewhat of a testimony i have not given it that force which so important a subject required i am humbled before god for my neglect and resolve now by his grace to leave no stone unturned till this iniquity be purged away from our zion well doctor said simeon you are certainly touching on a very dark and difficult subject and one in which it is hard to find out the path of duty perhaps it will be well to bear it in mind and by looking at it prayerfully some light may arise there are such great obstacles in the way that i do not see at present what can be done do you doctor i intend to preach on the subject next sunday and hereafter devote my best energies in the most public way to this great work said the doctor you doctor and now immediately why it appears to me you cannot do it you are the most unfit man possible whosoever's duty it may be it does not seem to me to be yours you already have more on your shoulders than you can carry you are hardly able to keep your ground now with all the odium of this new theology upon you such an effort would break up your church destroy the chance you have to do good here prevent the publication of your system if it's nobody's system but mine the world won't lose much if it never be published but if it be god's system nothing can hinder its appearing besides mr brown i ought not to be one man alone i count on your help i hold it as a special providence mr brown that in our own church an opportunity will be given to testify to the reality of disinterested benevolence how glorious the opportunity for a man to come out and testify by sacrificing his worldly living and business if you mr brown will at once at whatever sacrifice quit all connection with this detestable and diabolical slave trade you will exhibit a spectacle over which angels will rejoice and which will strengthen and encourage me to preach and write and testify mr simeon brown's usual demeanour was that of the most leathery imperturbability in calm theological reasoning he could demonstrate in the driest tone that if the eternal torment of six bodies and souls were absolutely the necessary means for preserving the eternal blessedness of thirty-six benevolence would require us to rejoice in it not in itself considered but in view of greater good and when he spoke not a nerve quivered the great mysterious sorrow with which the creation groaneth and travaileth the sorrow from which angels veil their faces never had touched one vibrating chord either of body or soul and he laid down the obligations of man to unconditional submission in a style which would have affected a person of delicate sensibility much like being mentally sawn in sunder benevolence when simeon brown spoke of it seemed the grimmest and unloveliest of gorgons for his mind seemed to resemble those fountains which petrify everything that falls into them but the hardest-shelled animals have a vital and sensitive part 
though only so large as the point of a needle and the doctor's innocent proposition to simeon to abandon his whole worldly estate for his principles touched this spot when benevolence required but the acquiescence in certain possible things which might be supposed to happen to his soul which after all he was comfortably certain never would happen or the acquiescence in certain suppositions sacrifices for the good of that most intangible of all abstractions being in general it was a dry calm subject but when it concerned the immediate giving up of his slave ships and a transfer of business attended with all that confusion and loss which he foresaw at a glance that he felt and felt too much to see clearly his swarthy face flushed his little blue eye kindled he walked up to the doctor and began speaking in the short energetic sentences of a man thoroughly awake to what he is talking about doctor you're too fast you are not a practical man doctor you are good in your pulpit nobody better your theology is clear nobody can argue better but come to practical matters why business has its laws doctor ministers are the most unfit men in the world to talk on such subjects it's departing from their sphere they talk about what they don't understand besides you take too much for granted i'm not sure that this trade is an evil i want to be convinced of it i'm sure it's a favour to these poor creatures to bring them to a christian land they are a thousand times better off here they can hear the gospel and have some chance of salvation if we want to get the gospel to the africans said the doctor why not send whole shiploads of missionaries to them and carry civilization and the arts and christianity to africa instead of stirring up wars tempting them to ravage each other's territories that we may get the booty think of the numbers killed in the wars of all that die on the passage is there any need of killing ninety-nine men to give the hundredth one the gospel when we could give the gospel to them all ah mr brown what if all the money spent in fitting out ships to bring the poor negroes here so prejudiced against christianity that they regard it with fear and aversion had been spent in sending it to them africa would have been covered with towns and villages rejoicing in civilization and christianity doctor you are a dreamer replied simeon an unpractical man your situation prevents your knowing anything of real life amen the lord be praised therefore said the doctor with a slowly increasing flush mounting to his cheek showing the burning brand of a smouldering fire of indignation now let me just talk common sense doctor which has its time and place just as much as theology and if you have the most theology i flatter myself i have the most common sense a business man must have it now just look at your situation how you stand you've got a most important work to do in order to do it you must keep your pulpit you must keep our church together we are few and weak we are a minority now there's not an influential man in your society that don't either hold slaves or engage in the trade and if you open upon this subject as you are going to do you'll just divide and destroy the church all men are not like you men are men and will be till they are thoroughly sanctified which never happens in this life and there will be an instant and most unfavourable agitation minds will be turned off from the discussion of the great saving doctrines of the gospel to a side issue you will be turned out and you know doctor you are not appreciated as you ought to be and it won't be easy for you to get a new settlement and then subscriptions will all drop off from your book and you won't be able to get that out and all this good will be lost to the world just for want of common sense there is a kind of wisdom in what you say mr brown replied the doctor naively but i fear much that it is the wisdom spoken in james three fifteen which descendeth not from above but is earthly sensual devilish you avoid the very point of the argument which is is this a sin against god 
that it is i am solemnly convinced and shall i use lightness or the things that i purpose do i purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea yea and nay nay no mr brown immediate repentance unconditional submission these are what i must preach as long as god gives me a pulpit to stand in whether men will hear or whether they will forbear well doctor said simeon shortly you can do as you like but i give you fair warning that i for one shall stop my subscription and go to dr stiles's church mr brown said the doctor solemnly rising and drawing his tall figure to its full height while a vivid light gleamed from his blue eye as to that you can do as you like but i think it my duty as your pastor to warn you that i have perceived in my conversation with you this morning such a want of true spiritual illumination and discernment as leads me to believe that you are yet in the flesh blinded by that carnal mind which is not subject to the law of god neither indeed can be i much fear you have no part nor lot in this matter and that you have need seriously to set yourself to search into the foundations of your hope for you may be like him of whom it is written isaiah forty four twenty he feedeth on ashes a deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say is there not a lie in my right hand the doctor delivered this address to this man of influence with the calmness of an ambassador charged with a message from a sovereign for which he is no otherwise responsible than to speak it in the most intelligible manner and then taking up his hat and cane he bade him good morning leaving simeon brown in a tumult of excitement which no previous theological discussion had ever raised in him end of section eleven section twelve of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter eleven the practical test the hens cackled drowsily in the barnyard of the white marvin house in the blue june afternoon sky sported great sailing islands of cloud whose white glistening heads looked in and out through the green apertures of maple and blossoming apple boughs the shadows of the trees had already turned eastward when the one-horse wagon of mrs Katy scudder appeared at the door where mrs marvin stood with a pleased quiet welcome in her soft brown eyes mrs scudder herself drove sitting on a seat in front while the doctor apparelled in the most faultless style with white wrist ruffles plaited shirt bosom immaculate wig and well-brushed coat sat by mary's side serenely unconscious how many feminine cares had gone to his getting up he did not know of the privy consultations the sewing stitchings and starchings the ironings the brushings the foldings and unfoldings and timely arrangements that gave such dignity and respectability to his outer man any more than the serene moon rising tranquilly behind a purple mountain-top troubles her calm head with treatises on astronomy it is enough for her to shine she thinks not how or why there is a vast amount of latent gratitude to women lying undeveloped in the hearts of men which would come out plentifully if they only knew what they did for them the doctor was so used to being well dressed that he never asked why that his wig always sat straight and even around his ample forehead not facetiously poked to one side nor assuming rakish airs unsuited to clerical dignity was entirely owing to mrs Katy scudder that his best broadcloth coat was not illustrated with shreds and patches fluff and dust and hanging in ungainly folds was owing to the same that his long silk stockings never had a treacherous stitch allowed to break out into a long running ladder 
was due to her watchfulness and that he wore spotless ruffles on his wrists or at his bosom was her doing also the doctor little thought while he in common with good ministers generally gently traduced the scriptural martha and insisted on the duty of heavenly abstractedness how much of his own leisure for spiritual contemplation was due to the martha-like talents of his hostess but then the good soul had it in him to be grateful and would have been unboundedly so if he had known his indebtedness as we trust most of our magnanimous masters would be mr zebedee marvyn was quietly sitting in the front summer parlour listening to the story of two of his brother church members between whom some difficulty had arisen in the settling of accounts jim bigelow a small dry dapper little individual known as general jobber and factotum and abram griswold a stolid wealthy well-to-do farmer and the fragments of conversation we catch are not uninteresting as showing mr zebedee's habits of thought and mode of treating those who came to him for advice i could have got along better if he'd a paid me regular every night said the squeaky voice of little jim but he was all as put me off till it come even change he said well tain't always handy replied the other one doesn't like to break into a five-pound note for nothing and i like to let it run till it comes even change but brother said mr zebedee turning over the great bible that lay on the mahogany stand in the corner we must go to the law and to the testimony and turning over the leaves he read from deuteronomy twenty four thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates at his day thou shalt give him his hire neither shall the sun go down upon it for he is poor and setteth his heart upon it lest he cry against thee unto the lord and it be sin unto thee you see what the bible has to say on the matter he said well now deacon i rather think you've got me in a tight place said mr griswold rising and turning confusedly round he saw the placid figure of the doctor who had entered the room unobserved in the midst of the conversation and was staring with that look of calm dreamy abstraction which often led people to suppose that he heard and saw nothing of what was going forward all rose reverently and while mr zebedee was shaking hands with the doctor and welcoming him to his house the other two silently withdrew making respectful obeisance mrs marvyn had drawn mary's hand gently under her arm and taken her to her own sleeping-room as it was her general habit to do that she might show her the last book she had been reading and pour into her ear the thoughts that had been kindled up by it mrs scudder after carefully brushing every speck of dust from the doctor's coat and seeing him seated in an armchair by the open window took out a long stocking of blue mixed yarn which she was knitting for his winter wear and pinning her knitting sheath on her side was soon trotting her needles contentedly in front of him the ill success of the doctor's morning attempt at enforcing his theology in practice rather depressed his spirits there was a noble innocence of nature in him which looked at hypocrisy with a puzzled and incredulous astonishment how a man could do so and be so was to him a problem at which his thoughts vainly laboured not that he was in the least discouraged or hesitating in regard to his own course when he had made up his mind to perform a duty the question of success no more entered his thoughts than those of the granite boulder to which we have before compared him when the time came for him to roll he did roll with the whole force of his being where he was to land was not his concern mildly and placidly he sat with his hands resting on his knees while mr zebedee and mrs scudder compared notes respecting the relative prospects of corn flax and buckwheat and thence passed to the doings of congress and the last proclamation of general washington pausing once in a while if peradventure the doctor might take up the conversation still he sat dreamily eyeing the flies as they fizzed down the panes of the half-open window i think said mr zebedee the prospects of the federal party were never brighter 
the doctor was a staunch federalist and generally warmed to this allurement but it did not serve this time suddenly drawing himself up a light came into his blue eyes and he said to mr marvin i'm thinking deacon if it is wrong to keep back the wages of a servant till after the going down of the sun what those are to do who keep them back all their lives there was a way the doctor had of hearing and seeing when he looked as if his soul were afar off and bringing suddenly into present conversation some fragment of the past on which he had been leisurely hammering in the quiet chambers of his brain which was sometimes quite startling this allusion to a passage of scripture which mr marvin was reading when he came in and which nobody supposed he had attended to startled mrs scudder who thought mentally now for it and laid down her knitting work and eyed her cousin anxiously mrs marvin and mary who had glided in and joined the circle looking interested and a slight flush rose and overspread the thin cheeks of mr marvin and his blue eyes deepened in a moment with a thoughtful shadow as he looked inquiringly at the doctor who proceeded my mind labours with this subject of the enslaving of the africans mr marvin we have just been declaring to the world that all men are born with an inalienable right to liberty we have fought for it and the lord of hosts has been with us and can we stand before him with our foot upon our brother's neck a generous upright nature is always more sensitive to blame than another sensitive in proportion to the amount of its reverence for good and mr marvin's face flushed his eye kindled and his compressed respiration showed how deeply the subject moved him mrs marvin's eyes turned on him an anxious look of inquiry he answered however calmly doctor i have thought of the subject myself mrs marvin has lately been reading a pamphlet of mr thomas clarkson's on the slave trade and she was saying to me only last night that she did not see but the argument extended equally to holding slaves one thing i confess stumbles me was there not an express permission given to israel to buy and hold slaves of old doubtless said the doctor but many permissions were given to them which were local and temporary for if we hold them to apply to the human race the turks might quote the bible for making slaves of us if they could and the algerines have the scripture all on their side and our own blacks at some future time if they can get the power might justify themselves in making slaves of us i assure you sir said mr marvin if i speak it is not to excuse myself but i am quite sure my servants do not desire liberty and would not take it if it were offered call them in and try it said the doctor if they refuse it is their own matter there was a gentle movement in the group at the directness of this personal application but mr marvin replied calmly cato is up at the eight-acre lot but you may call in candace my dear call candace and let the doctor put the question to her candace was at this moment sitting before the ample fireplace in the kitchen with two iron kettles before her nestled each in its bed of hickory coals which gleamed out from their white ashes like sleepy red eyes opening and shutting in one was coffee which she was burning stirring vigorously with a pudding stick and in the other puffy doughnuts in shapes of rings hearts and marvellous twists which candace had such a special proclivity for making that mrs marvin's table and closets never knew an intermission of their presence candace the doctor wishes to see you said mrs marvin bless his heart said candace looking up perplexed wants to see me does he can't nobody have me till dis yer coffee's done a minute's a minute's in coffee but i'll be in directly she added in a patronizing tone missus you just go long in and i'll be dar directly a few moments after candace joined the group in the sitting-room having hastily tied a clean white apron over her blue linsey working dress and donned the brilliant madras which james had lately given her and which she had a barbaric fashion of arranging so as to give to her head the air of a gigantic butterfly she sunk a dutiful curtsey and stood twirling her thumbs while the doctor surveyed her gravely <laughs> 
candace said he do you think it right that the black race should be slaves to the white the face and air of candace presented a curious picture at this moment a sort of rude sense of delicacy embarrassed her and she turned a deprecating look first on mrs marvyn and then on her master don't mind us said mrs marvyn tell the doctor the exact truth candace stood still a moment and the spectator saw a deeper shadow roll over her sable face like a cloud over a dark pool of water and her immense person heaved with her laboured breathing if i must speak i must she said no i never did tink twas right when general washington was here i hearn him read the declaration of independence and bill o rights and i told cato den says i ef dat are true you and i are as free as anybody it stands to reason why look at me i ain't a critter i's neither hoofs nor horns i's a reasonable being a woman as much a woman as anybody she said holding up her head with an air as majestic as a palm tree and cato he's a man born free and equal ef dar's any truth in what you read that's all but candace you've always been contented and happy with us have you not said mr marvin yes massa i hain't got nothin to complain of in dat matter i could a had no better friends than you and missus would you like your liberty if you could get it though said mr marvin answer me honestly why to be sure i should who wouldn't mind you she said earnestly raising her black heavy hand tain't dat i want to go off or want to shirk work but i want to feel free dem dat isn't free has nothin to give to nobody dey can't show what dey would do well candace from this day you are free said mr marvin solemnly candace covered her face with both her fat hands and shook and trembled and finally throwing her apron over her head made a desperate rush for the door and threw herself down in the kitchen in a perfect tropical torrent of tears and sobs you see said the doctor what freedom is to every human being the blessing of the lord will be on this deed mr marvin the steps of a just man are ordered by the lord and he delighteth in his way at this moment candace reappeared at the door her butterfly turban somewhat deranged with the violence of her prostration giving a whimsical air to her portly person i want ye all to know she said with a clearing up snuff dat it's my will and pleasure to go right on doin my work just the same and missus please i allus put three eggs in de crullers now and i won't turn de wash basin down in de sink but hang it jam up on de nail and i won't pick up chips in a milk pan ef i'm in ever so big a hurry i'll do everything just as ye tells me now you try me and see ef i won't candace here alluded to some of the little private wilfulnesses which she had always obstinately cherished as reserved rights in pursuing domestic matters with her mistress i intend said mr marvin to make the same offer to your husband when he returns from work to-night laws massa waikato he'll do just as i do dere ain't no kind of need of askin him course he will a smile passed round the circle because between candace and her husband there existed one of those whimsical contrasts which one sometimes sees in married life cato was a small-built thin softly spoken negro addicted to a gentle chronic cough and though a faithful and skilful servant seemed in relation to his better half much like a hill of potatoes under a spreading apple tree candace held to him with a vehement and patronizing fondness so devoid of conjugal reverence as to excite the comments of her friends you must remember candace said a good deacon to her one day when she was ordering him about at a catechizing you ought to give honour to your husband the wife is the weaker vessel i de weaker vessel said candace looking down from the tower of her ample corpulence on the small quiet man whom she had been fledging with the ample folds of a worsted comforter out of which his little head and shining bead eyes looked much like a blackbird in a nest i de weaker vessel huh a whole woman's rights convention could not have expressed more in a day than was given in that single look and word 
candace considered a husband as a thing to be taken care of a rather inconsequent and somewhat troublesome species of pet to be humoured nursed fed clothed and guided in the way that he was to go an animal that was always losing of buttons catching colds wearing his best coat every day and getting on his sunday hat in a surreptitious manner for week-day occasions but she often condescended to express it as her opinion that he was a blessing and that she didn't know what she would do if it wasn't for cato in fact he seemed to supply her that which we are told is the great want in woman's situation an object in life she sometimes was heard expressing herself very energetically in disapprobation of the conduct of one of her sable friends named jinny styles who after being presented with her own freedom worked several years to buy that of her husband but became afterwards so disgusted with her acquisition that she declared she would never buy another nigger now jinny don't know what she's talking about she would say s'pose he does cough and keep her awake nights and take a little too much sometimes and he better no husband at all a body wouldn't seem to have nothin to live for ef dey hadn't an old man to look arter men is naturally foolish about some things but dey's good deal better than nothin and candace after this condescending remark would lift off with one hand a brass kettle in which poor cato might have been drowned and fly across the kitchen with it as if it were a feather end of section twelve section thirteen of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter twelve part one miss prissy will our little mary really fall in love with the doctor the question reaches us in anxious tones from all the circle of our readers and what especially shocks us is that grave doctors of divinity and serious stocking knitting matrons seem to be the class who are particularly set against the success of our excellent orthodox hero and bent on reminding us of the claims of that unregenerate james whom we have sent to see on purpose that our heroine may recover herself of that foolish partiality for him which all the christian world seems bent on perpetuating now really says the rev mrs q looking up from her bundle of sewing society work you are not going to let mary marry the doctor my dear madam is not that just what you did yourself after having turned off three or four fascinating young sinners as good as james any day don't make us believe that you are sorry for it now is it possible says dr theophrastus who is himself a staunch hopkinsian divine and who is at present recovering from his last grand effort on natural and moral ability is it possible that you are going to let mary forget that poor young man and marry dr h that will never do in the world dear doctor consider what would have become of you if some lady at a certain time had not had the sense and discernment to fall in love with the man who came to her disguised as a theologian but he's so old says aunt maria not at all old what do you mean forty is the very season of ripeness the very meridian of manly lustre and splendour but he wears a wig my dear madam so did sir charles grandison and lovelace and all the other fine fellows of those days the wig was the distinguishing mark of a gentleman no spite of all you may say and declare we do insist that our doctor is a very proper and probable subject for a young lady to fall in love with if women have one weakness more marked than another it is towards veneration they are born worshippers makers of silver shrines for some divinity or other which of course they always think fell straight down from heaven the first step towards their falling in love with an ordinary mortal is generally to dress him out with all manner of real or fancied superiority and having made him up they worship him 
now a truly great man a man really grand and noble in heart and intellect has this advantage with women that he is an idol ready-made to hand and so that very painstaking and ingenious sex have less labour in getting him up and can be ready to worship him on shorter notice in particular is this the case where a sacred profession and a moral supremacy are added to the intellectual just think of the career of celebrated preachers and divines in all ages have they not stood like the image that nebuchadnezzar the king set up and all womankind coquettes and flirts not excepted been ready to fall down and worship even before the sound of cornet flute harp sackbut and so forth is not the faithful paula with her beautiful face prostrate in reverence before poor old lean haggard dying st jerome in the most splendid painting of the world an emblem and sign of woman's eternal power of self-sacrifice to what she deems noblest in man does not old richard baxter tell us with delightful single-heartedness how his wife fell in love with him first spite of his long pale face and how she confessed dear soul after many years of married life that she had found him less sour and bitter than she had expected the fact is women are burdened with fealty faith reverence more than they know what to do with they stand like a hedge of sweet peas throwing out fluttering tendrils everywhere for something high and strong to climb by and when they find it be it ever so rough in the bark they catch upon it and instances are not wanting of those who have turned away from the flattery of admirers to prostrate themselves at the feet of a genuine hero who never wooed them except by heroic deeds and the rhetoric of a noble life never was there a distinguished man whose greatness could sustain the test of minute domestic inspection better than our doctor strong in a single-hearted humility a perfect unconsciousness of self an honest and sincere absorption in high and holy themes and objects there was in him what we so seldom see a perfect logic of life his minutest deeds were the true results of his sublimest principles his whole nature moral physical and intellectual was simple pure and cleanly he was temperate as an anchorite in all matters of living avoiding from a healthy instinct all those intoxicating stimuli then common among the clergy in his early youth indeed he had formed an attachment to the almost universal clerical pipe but observing a delicate woman once nauseated by coming into the atmosphere which he and his brethren had polluted he set himself gravely to reflect that that which could so offend a woman must needs be uncomely and unworthy a christian man wherefore he laid his pipe on the mantelpiece and never afterwards resumed the indulgence in all his relations with womanhood he was delicate and reverential forming his manners by that old precept the elder women entreat as mothers the younger as sisters which rule short and simple as it is is nevertheless the most perfect resume of all true gentlemanliness then as for person the doctor was not handsome to be sure but he was what sometimes serves with woman better majestic and manly and when animated by thought and feeling having even a commanding grandeur of mien add to all this that our valiant hero is now on the straight road to bring him into that situation most likely to engage the warm partisanship of a true woman namely that of a man unjustly abused for right doing and one may see that it is ten to one our mary may fall in love with him yet before she knows it if it were not for this mysterious selfness and sameness which makes this wild wandering uncanonical sailor james marvin so intimate and eternal if his thread were not knit up with the thread of her life were it not for the old habit of feeling for him thinking for him praying for him hoping for him fearing for him which woe is us is the unfortunate habit 
of womankind if it were not for that fatal something which neither judgment nor wishes nor reason nor common sense shows any great skill in unravelling we are quite sure that mary would be in love with the doctor within the next six months as it is we leave you all to infer from your own heart and consciousness what his chances are a new sort of scene is about to open on our heroine and we shall show her to you for an evening at least in new associations and with a different background from that homely and rural one in which she has fluttered as a white dove amid leafy and congenial surroundings as we have before intimated newport presented a resume of many different phases of society all brought upon a social level by the then universally admitted principle of equality there were scattered about in the settlement lordly mansions whose owners rolled in emblazoned carriages and whose wide halls were the scenes of a showy and almost princely hospitality by her husband's side mrs katie scudder was allied to one of these families of wealthy planters and often recognized the connection with a quiet undertone of satisfaction as a dignified and self-respecting woman should she liked once in a while quietly to let people know that although they lived in the plain little cottage and made no pretensions yet they had good blood in their veins that mr scudder's mother was a wilcox and that the wilcoxes were she supposed as high as anybody generally ending the remark with the observation that all these things to be sure were matters of small consequence since at last it would be of far more importance to have been a true christian than to have been connected with the highest families of the land nevertheless mrs scudder was not a little pleased to have in her possession a card of invitation to a splendid wedding party that was going to be given on friday at the wilcox manor she thought it a very becoming mark of respect to the deceased mr scudder that his widow and daughter should be brought to mind so becoming and praiseworthy in fact that though an old woman as she said with a complacent straightening of her tall lithe figure she really thought she must make an effort to go accordingly early one morning after all domestic duties had been fulfilled and the clock loudly ticking through the empty rooms told that all needful bustle had died down to silence mrs katy mary and miss prissy diamond the dressmaker might have been observed sitting in solemn senate around the camphor wood trunk before spoken of and which exhaled vague foreign and indian perfumes of silk and sandalwood you may have heard of dignitaries my good reader but i assure you you know very little of a situation of trust or importance compared to that of the dressmaker in a small new england town what important interests does she hold in her hands how is she besieged courted deferred to three months beforehand all her days and nights are spoken for and the simple statement that only on that day you can have miss clippers is of itself an apology for any omission of attention elsewhere it strikes home at once to the deepest consciousness of every woman married or single how thoughtfully is everything arranged weeks beforehand for the golden important season when miss clippers can come on that day there is to be no extra sweeping dusting cleaning cooking no visiting no receiving no reading or writing but all with one heart and soul are to wait upon her intent to forward the great work which she graciously affords a day's leisure to direct seated in her chair of state with her well-worn cushion bristling with pins and needles at her side her ready roll of patterns and her scissors she hears judges and decides ex cathedra on the possible or not possible in that important art on which depends the right presentation of the floral part of nature's great horticultural show she alone is competent to say whether there is any available remedy for the stained breadth in jane's dress 
whether the fatal spot by any magical hocus-pocus can be cut out from the fullness or turned up and smothered from view in the gathers or concealed by some new fashion of trimming falling with generous appropriateness exactly across the fatal weak point she can tell you whether that remnant of velvet will make you a basque whether mamma's old silk can reappear in juvenile grace for miss lucy what marvels follow her wherever she goes what wonderful results does she contrive from the most unlikely materials as everybody after her departure wonders to see old things become so much better than new among the most influential and happy of her class was miss prissy diamond a little dapper doll-like body quick in her motions and nimble in her tongue whose delicate complexion flaxen curls merry flow of spirits and ready abundance of gaiety song and story apart from her professional accomplishments made her a welcome guest in every family in the neighbourhood miss prissy laughingly boasted being past forty sure that the avowal would always draw down on her quite a storm of compliments on the freshness of her sweet pea complexion and the brightness of her merry blue eyes she was well pleased to hear dawning girls wondering why with so many advantages she had never married at such remarks miss prissy always laughed loudly and declared that she had always had such a string of engagements with the women that she never found half an hour to listen to what any man living would say to her supposing she could stop to hear him besides if i were to get married nobody else could she would say what would become of all the wedding clothes for everybody else but sometimes when miss prissy felt extremely gracious she would draw out of her little chest just the faintest tip end of a sigh and tell some young lady in a confidential undertone that one of these days she would tell her something and then there would come a wink of her blue eyes and a fluttering of the pink ribbons in her cap quite stimulating to youthful inquisitiveness though we have never been able to learn by any of our antiquarian researches that the expectations thus excited were ever gratified in her professional prowess she felt a pardonable pride what feats could she relate of wonderful dresses got out of impossibly small patterns of silk what marvels of silks turned that could not be told from new what reclaimings of waists that other dressmakers had hopelessly spoiled had not mrs general wilcox once been obliged to call in her aid on a dress sent to her from paris and did not miss prissy work three days and nights on that dress and make every stitch of that trimming over with her own hands before it was fit to be seen and when mrs governor dexter's best silver-gray brocade was spoiled by miss pimlico and there wasn't another scrap to pattern it with didn't she make a new waist out of the cape and piece one of the sleeves twenty-nine times and yet nobody would ever have known that there was a joining in it in fact though miss prissy enjoyed the fair average plain sailing of her work she might be said to revel in difficulties a full pattern with trimming all ample and ready awoke a moderate enjoyment but the resurrection of anything half worn or imperfectly made the brilliant success when after turning twisting piecing contriving and by unheard-of inventions of trimming a dress faded and defaced was restored to more than pristine splendour that was a triumph worth enjoying it was true miss prissy like most of her nomadic compeers was a little given to gossip but after all it was innocent gossip not a bit of malice in it it was only all the particulars about mrs thus and so's wardrobe all the statistics of mrs that and t'other's china closet all the minute items of miss simpkins's wedding clothes and how her mother cried the morning of the wedding and said that she didn't know anything how she could spare louisa jane only that edward was such a good boy that she felt she could love him like an own son and what a providence it seemed that the very ring that was put into the bride loaf was one that he gave her when he first went to sea when she wouldn't be engaged to him because she thought she loved thomas strickland better but that was only because she hadn't found him out you know and so forth and so forth 
sometimes too her narrations assumed a solemn cast and brought to mind the hush of funerals and told of words spoken in faint whispers when hands were clasped for the last time and of utterances crushed out from hearts when the hammer of a great sorrow strikes out sparks of the divine even from common stone and there would be real tears in the little blue eyes and the pink bows would flutter tremulously like the last three leaves on a bare scarlet maple in autumn in fact dear reader gossip like romance has its noble side to it how can you love your neighbour as yourself and not feel a little curiosity as to how he fares what he wears where he goes and how he takes the great life tragi comedy at which you and he are both more than spectators show me a person who lives in a country village absolutely without curiosity or interest on these subjects and i will show you a cold fat oyster to whom the tide mud of propriety is the whole of existence as one of our esteemed collaborators remarks a dull town where there is neither theatre nor circus nor opera must have some excitement and the real tragedy and comedy of life must come in place of the second hand hence the noted gossiping propensities of country places which so long as they are not poisoned by envy or ill-will have a respectable and picturesque side to them an undoubted leave to be as probably has almost everything which obstinately and always insists on being except sin as it is it must be confessed that the arrival of miss prissy in a family was much like the setting up of a domestic showcase through which you could look into all the families in the neighbourhood and see the never-ending drama of life births marriages deaths joy of new-made mothers whose babes weighed just eight pounds and three quarters and had hair that would part with a comb and tears of rachels who wept for their children and would not be comforted because they were not was there a tragedy a mystery in all newport whose secret closet had not been unlocked by miss prissy she thought not and you always wondered with an uncertain curiosity what those things might be over which she gravely shook her head declaring with such a look oh if you only could know and ending with a general sigh and lamentation like the confidential chorus of a greek tragedy End of section 13section 14 of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter 12 part two we have been thus minute in sketching miss prissy's portrait because we rather like her she has great power we admit and were she a sour-faced angular energetic body with a heart whose secretions had all become acrid by disappointment and dyspepsia she might be a fearful gnome against whose family visitations one ought to watch and pray as it was she came into the house rather like one of those breezy days of spring which burst all the blossoms set all the doors and windows open make the hens cackle and the turtles peep filling a solemn puritan dwelling with as much bustle and chatter as if a box of martins were setting up housekeeping in it let us now introduce you to the sanctuary of mrs scudder's own private bedroom where the committee of exigencies with miss prissy at their head are seated in solemn session around the camphor wood trunk dress you know is of some importance after all said mrs scudder in that apologetic way in which sensible people generally acknowledge a secret leaning towards anything so very mundane while the good lady spoke she was reverentially unpinning and shaking out of their fragrant folds creamy crape shawls of rich chinese embroidery india muslin scarfs and aprons and already her hands were undoing the pins of a silvery damask linen in which was wrapped her own wedding dress i have always told mary she continued that though our hearts ought not to be set on these things yet they had their importance 
certainly certainly ma'am chimed in miss prissy i was saying to miss general wilcox the other day i didn't see how we could consider the lilies of the field without seeing the importance of looking pretty i've got a flower de luce in my garden now from one of the new roots that old major seaforth brought over from france which is just the most beautiful thing you ever did see and i was thinking as i looked at it to-day that if women's dresses only grew on em as handsome and well-fitting as that why there wouldn't be any need of me but as it is why we must think if we want to look well now peach trees i suppose might bear just as good peaches without the pink blows but then who would want em to miss deacon twitchell when i was up there the other day kept kind of sighin cause sorintha ann is getting a new pink silk made up cause she said it was such a dying world it didn't seem right to call off our attention but i told her it wasn't any pinker than the apple blossoms and what with robins and bluebirds and one thing or another the lord is always calling off our attention and i think we ought to observe the lord's works and take a lesson from em yes you are quite right said mrs scudder rising and shaking out a splendid white brocade on which bunches of moss roses were looped to bunches of violets by graceful fillets of blue ribbons this was my wedding dress she said little miss prissy sprang up and clapped her hands in an ecstasy well now miss scudder really did i ever see anything more beautiful it really goes beyond anything i ever saw i don't think in all the brocades i ever made up i ever saw so pretty a pattern as this mr scudder chose it for me himself at the silk factory in lyons said mrs scudder with pardonable pride and i want it tried on to marry really miss scudder this ought to be kept for her wedding dress said miss prissy as she delightedly bustled about the congenial task i was up to miss marvin's a-working last week she said as she threw the dress over mary's head and she said that james expected to make his fortune in that voyage and come home and settle down mary's fair head emerged from the rustling folds of the brocade her cheeks crimson as one of the moss roses while her mother's face assumed a severe gravity as she remarked that she believed james had been much pleased with jane spencer and that for her part she should be very glad when he came home if he could marry such a steady sensible girl and settle down to a useful christian life ah yes just so a very excellent idea certainly said miss prissy it wants a little taken in here on the shoulders and a little under the arms the biases are all right the sleeves will want altering miss scudder i hope you will have a hot iron ready for pressing mrs scudder rose immediately to see the command obeyed and as her back was turned miss prissy went on in a low tone now i for my part don't think there's a word of truth in that story about james marvin and jane spencer for i was down there at work one day when he called and i know there couldn't have been anything between them besides miss spencer her mother told me there wasn't there miss scudder you see that is a good fit it's astonishing how near it comes to fitting just as it was i didn't think mary was so near what you were when you were a girl miss scudder the other day when i was up to general wilcox the general he was in the room when i was a-trying on miss wilcox cherry velvet and she was asking couldn't i come this week for her and i mentioned i was coming to miss scudder and the general says he i used to know her when she was a girl i tell you she was one of the handsomest girls in newport by george says he and says i general you ought to see her daughter and the general you know his jolly way he laughed and says he if she is as handsome as her mother was i don't want to see her says he i tell you wife says he i but just miss falling in love with katie stevens i could have told her more than that said mrs scudder with a flash of her old coquette girlhood for a moment lighting her eyes and straightening her lithe form i guess if i should show a letter he wrote me once 
but what am i talking about she said suddenly stiffening back into a sensible woman miss prissy do you think it will be necessary to cut it off at the bottom it seems a pity to cut such rich silk so it does i declare well i believe it will do to turn it up i depend on you to put it a little into modern fashion you know said mrs scudder it is many a year you know since it was made oh never you fear you leave all that to me said miss prissy now there never was anything so lucky as that just before all these wedding dresses had to be fixed i got a letter from my sister martha that works for all the first families of boston and martha she is really unusually privileged because she works for miss cranch and miss cranch gets letters from miss adams you know mr adams is ambassador now at the court of st james and miss adams writes home all the particulars about the court dresses and martha she heard one of the letters read and she told miss cranch that she would give the best five-pound note she had if she could just copy that description to send to prissy well miss cranch let her do it and i've got a copy of the letter here in my work pocket i read it up to miss general wilcox and to major seaforce and i'll read it to you mrs katie scudder was a born subject of a crown and though now a republican matron had not outlived the reverence from childhood implanted for the high and stately doings of courts lords ladies queens and princesses and therefore it was not without some awe that she saw miss prissy produce from her little black work-bag the well-worn epistle here it is said miss prissy at last i only copied out the parts about being presented at court she says one is obliged here to attend the circles of the queen which are held once a fortnight and what renders it very expensive is that you cannot go twice in the same dress and a court dress you cannot make use of elsewhere i directed my mantua maker to let my dress be elegant but plain as i could possibly appear with decency accordingly it is white lute string covered and full trimmed with white crape festooned with lilac ribbon and mock point lace over a hoop of enormous size there is only a narrow train about three yards in length to the gown waist which is put into a ribbon on the left side the queen only having her train borne ruffled cuffs for married ladies treble lace ruffles a very dress cap with long lace lappets two white plumes and a blonde lace handkerchief this is my rigging miss prissy here stopped to adjust her spectacles her audience expressed a breathless interest you see she said i used to know her when she was nabby smith she was parson smith's daughter at weymouth and a, as handsome a girl as ever i wanted to see just as graceful as a sweet briar bush i don't believe any of those english ladies looked one bit better than she did she was always a master hand at writing everything she writes about she puts it right before you you feel as if you've been there now here she goes on to tell about her daughter's dress she says my head is dressed for st james's and in my opinion looks very tasty whilst my daughter is undergoing the same operation i set myself down composedly to write you a few lines well methinks i hear betsy and lucy say what is cousin's dress white my dear girls like your aunt's only differently trimmed and ornamented her train being wholly of white crape and trimmed with white ribbon the petticoat which is the most showy part of the dress covered and drawn up in what are called festoons with light wreaths of beautiful flowers the sleeves white crape drawn over the silk with a row of lace round the sleeve near the shoulder another halfway down the arm and a third upon the top of the ruffle a little stuck between a kind of hat cap with three large feathers and a bunch of flowers a wreath of flowers on the hair miss prissy concluded this relishing description with a little smack of the lips such as people sometimes give when reading things that are particularly to their taste now i was a-thinking she added that it would be an excellent way to trim mary's sleeves three rows of lace with a sprig to each row all this while our mary with her white short gown and blue stuffed petticoat her shining pale brown hair and serious large blue eyes sat innocently looking first at her mother then at miss prissy and then at the finery 
we do not claim for her any superhuman exemption from girlish feelings she was innocently dazzled with the vision of courtly halls and princely splendours and thought mrs adams's descriptions almost a perfect realization of things she had read in sir charles grandison if her mother thought it right and proper she should be dressed and made fine she was glad of it only there came a heavy leaden feeling in her little heart which she did not understand but we who know womankind will translate for you it was that a certain pair of dark eyes would not see her after she was dressed and so after all what was the use of looking pretty i wonder what james would think passed through her head for mary had never changed a ribbon or altered the braid of her hair or pinned a flower in her bosom that she had not quickly seen the effect of the change mirrored in those dark eyes it was a pity of course now she had found out that she ought not to think about him that so many thought-strings were twisted round him so while miss prissy turned over her papers and read out of others extracts about lord carmarthen and sir clement cotterell dormer and the princess royal and princess augusta in black and silver with a silver netting upon the coat and a head stuck full of diamond pins and lady salisbury and lady talbert and the duchess of devonshire and scarlet satin sacks and diamonds and ostrich plumes and the king's kissing mrs adams little mary's blue eyes grew larger and larger seeing far off on the salt green sea and her ears heard only the ripple and murmur of those waters that carried her heart away till by and by miss prissy gave her a smart little tap which awakened her to the fact that she was wanted again to try on the dress which miss prissy's nimble fingers had basted so passed the day miss prissy busily chattering clipping basting mary patiently trying on to an unheard-of extent and mrs scudder's neat room whipped into a perfect froth and foam of gauze lace artificial flowers linings and other aids accessories and abetments at dinner the doctor who had been all the morning studying out his treatise on the millennium discoursed tranquilly as usual innocently ignorant of the unusual cares which were distracting the minds of his listeners what should he know of dressmakers good soul encouraged by the respectful silence of his auditors he calmly expanded and soliloquized on his favourite topic the last golden age of time the marriage supper of the lamb when the purified earth like a repentant psyche shall be restored to the long-lost favour of a celestial bridegroom and glorified saints and angels shall walk familiarly as wedding guests among men sakes alive said little miss prissy after dinner did i ever hear any one go on like that blessed man such a spiritual mind oh miss scudder how you are privileged in having him here i do really think it is a shame such a blessed man aunt thought more of why i could just sit and hear him talk all day miss scudder i wish sometimes you'd just let me make a ruffled shirt for him and do it all up myself and put a stitch in the hem that i learned from my sister martha who learned it from a french young lady who was educated in a convent nuns you know poor things can do some things right and i think i never saw such hem stitching as they do there and i should like to hem stitch the doctor's ruffles he is so spiritually minded it really makes me love him why hearing him talk put me in mind of a real beautiful song of mr watts i don't know as i could remember the tune and miss prissy whose musical talent was one of her special forts tuned her voice a little cracked and quavering and sang with a vigorous accent on each accented syllable from the third heaven where god resides that a holy happy place the new jerusalem comes down adorned with shining grace attending angels shout for joy and the bright army sing mortals behold the sacred seat of your descending king take care miss scudder that silk must be cut exactly on the bias and miss prissy hastily finishing her last quaver caught the silk and the scissors out of mrs scudder's hand and fell down at once from the millennium into a discourse on her own particular way of covering piping cord so we go dear reader so long as we have a body and a soul two worlds must mingle the great and the little the solemn and the trivial breathing in and out like the grotesque carvings on a gothic shrine only did we know it rightly nothing is trivial since the human soul with its awful shadow makes all things sacred have not ribbons cast off flowers 
soiled bits of gauze trivial trashy fragments of millinery sometimes had an awful meaning a deadly power when they belonged to one who should wear them no more and whose beautiful form frail and crushed as they is a hidden and a vanished thing for all time for so sacred an individual is a human being that of all the million peopled earth no one form ever restores another the mould of each mortal type is broken at the grave and never never though you look through all the faces on earth shall the exact form you mourn ever meet your eyes again you are living your daily life among trifles that one death-stroke may make relics one false step one luckless accident an obstacle on the track of a train the tangling of the cord in shifting a sail and the penknife the pen the papers the trivial articles of dress and clothing which to-day you toss idly and jestingly from hand to hand may become dread memorials of that awful tragedy whose deep abyss ever underlies our common life End of section 14section fifteen of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter thirteen the party well let us proceed to tell how the eventful evening drew on how mary by miss prissy's care stood at last in a long-waisted gown flowered with rosebuds and violets opening in front to display a white satin skirt trimmed with lace and flowers how her little feet were put into high-heeled shoes and a little jaunty cap with a wreath of moss rosebuds was fastened over her shining hair and how miss prissy delighted turned her round and round and then declared that she must go and get the doctor to look at her she knew he must be a man of taste he talked so beautifully about the millennium and so bursting into his study she actually chattered him back into the visible world and leading the blushing mary to the door asked him point-blank if he ever saw anything prettier the doctor being now wide awake gravely gave his mind to the subject and after some consideration said gravely no he didn't think he ever did for the doctor was not a man of compliment and had a habit of always thinking before he spoke whether what he was going to say was exactly true and having lived some time in the family of president edwards renowned for beautiful daughters he naturally thought them over the doctor looked innocent and helpless while miss prissy having got him now quite into her power went on volubly to expatiate on the difficulties overcome in adapting the ancient wedding dress to its present modern fit he told her that it was very nice said yes ma'am at proper places and being a very obliging man looked at whatever he was directed to with round blank eyes but ended all with a long gaze on the laughing blushing face that half in shame and half in perplexed mirth appeared and disappeared as miss prissy in her warmth turned her round and showed her now don't she look beautiful miss prissy reiterated for the twentieth time as mary left the room the doctor looking after her musingly said to himself the king's daughter is all glorious within her clothing is of wrought gold she shall be brought into the king in raiment of needlework now did i ever said miss prissy rushing out how that good man does turn everything i believe you couldn't get anything that he wouldn't find a text right out of the bible about it i mean to get the linen for that shirt this very week with the miss wilcox money they always pay well those wilcoxes and i've worked for them off and on sixteen days and a quarter to be sure miss scudder there's no real need of my doing it for i must say you keep him looking like a pink but only i feel as if i must do something for such a good man the good doctor was brushed up for the evening with zealous care and energy and if he did not look like a pink it was certainly no fault of his hostess 
well we cannot reproduce in detail the faded glories of that entertainment nor relate how the wilcox manor and gardens were illuminated how the bride wore a veil of real point lace how carriages rolled and grated on the gravel walks and negro servants in white kid gloves handed out ladies in velvet and satin to mary's inexperienced eye it seemed like an enchanted dream a realization of all she had dreamed of grand and high society she had her little triumph of an evening for everybody asked who that beautiful girl was and more than one gallant of the old newport first families felt himself adorned and distinguished to walk with her on his arm busy officious dowagers repeated to mrs scudder the applauding whispers that followed her wherever she went really mrs scudder said gallant old general wilcox where have you kept such a beauty all this time it's a sin and a shame to hide such a light under a bushel and mrs scudder though of course like you and me sensible reader properly apprised of the perishable nature of such fleeting honours was like us too but a mortal and smiled condescendingly on the follies of the scene the house was divided by a wide hall opening by doors the front one upon the street the back into a large garden the broad central walk of which edged on each side with high clipped hedges of box now resplendent with coloured lamps seemed to continue the prospect in a brilliant vista the old-fashioned garden was lighted in every part and the company dispersed themselves about it in picturesque groups we have the image in our mind of mary as she stood with her little hat and wreath of rosebuds her fluttering ribbons and rich brocade as it were a picture framed in the doorway with her back to the illuminated garden and her calm innocent face regarding with a pleased wonder the unaccustomed gaieties within her dress which under miss prissy's forming hand had been made to assume that appearance of style and fashion which more particularly characterized the mode of those times formed a singular but not unpleasing contrast to the sort of dewy freshness of air and mien which was characteristic of her style of beauty it seemed so to represent a being who was in the world yet not of it who though living habitually in a higher region of thought and feeling was artlessly curious and innocently pleased with a fresh experience in an altogether untried sphere the feeling of being in a circle to which she did not belong where her presence was in a manner an accident and where she felt none of the responsibilities which come from being a component part of a society gave to her a quiet disengaged air which produced all the effect of the perfect ease of high breeding while she stands there there comes out of the door of the bridal reception-room a gentleman with a stylishly dressed lady on either arm with whom he seems wholly absorbed he is of middle height peculiarly graceful in form and moulding with that indescribable air of high breeding which marks the polished man of the world his beautifully formed head delicate profile fascinating sweetness of smile and above all an eye which seemed to have an almost mesmeric power of attraction were traits which distinguished one of the most celebrated men of the time and one whose peculiar history yet lives not only in our national records but in the private annals of many an american family good heavens he said suddenly pausing in conversation as his eye accidentally fell upon mary who is that lovely creature oh that said mrs wilcox why that is mary scudder her father was of a family connection of the general's the family are in rather modest circumstances but highly respectable after a few moments more of ordinary chit-chat in which from time to time he darted upon her glances of rapid and piercing observation the gentleman might have been observed to disembarrass himself of one of the ladies on his arm by passing her with a compliment and a bow to another gallant and after a few moments more he spoke something to mrs wilcox in a low voice and with that gentle air 
of deferential sweetness which always made everybody well satisfied to do his will the consequence was that in a few moments mary was startled from her calm speculations by the voice of mrs wilcox saying at her elbow in a formal tone miss scudder i have the honour to present to your acquaintance colonel burr of the united states senate End of section fifteen